Good evening, and welcome to Mining the Riches of the Parsha. Tonight is, of course, the first night of Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. And today is Thursday, December 7th, 2023. It is a great privilege for me to be able to be here with you tonight, and I'm grateful to everyone who is here and setting aside the time to study together. And I'd like to share with you tonight two pieces relating to Hanukkah. So on Hanukkah, we add a prayer to our regular daily prayers, to the Amidah, to the Shemona Asrei, and the same prayer we add to the Benching, the Birkat Amazon, the Grace After Meals. And the prayer that we add for Hanukkah is two paragraphs. The first paragraph starts with the words Al Hanisim, we thank God for the miracle of Hanukkah. And then there's a second paragraph with a very brief description of the Hanukkah story. Two paragraphs in every Amidah starting tonight through the end of Hanukkah and every Benjamin. Now, the same thing happens for Purim. Two paragraphs, the first one's the same. The second one is a short version of the Purim story. And that prayer for Purim begins with the words, Bime Mordechai Esther." In the days of Mordechai and Esther, this is the story that happened, the Purim story. Now clearly, those opening words, Bime Mordechai Esther" in the days of Mordechai and Esther, they don't only locate the Purim story in time, to tell us when it happened, when did it happen? Bimei, Mordechai, and Esther, during the lifetime of Mordechai and Esther. So it tells us when it happened, but of course it also tells us the two main characters. Mordechai and Esther were central to the story of Purim. For Hanukkah, the paragraph begins, Bimei Matis Yo, Ben Yochanan Kohen Gadol. In the days of Matis Yo, the son of Yochanan the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. So, again, this locates the Hanukkah story. Actually, the Hanukkah story occurs later in history than the Purim story. The Hanukkah story takes place during the middle of the Second Temple period. The Second Temple, the Second Beis Amigdash, stood in Jerusalem for approximately 400 years. And the Hanukkah story starts at about the year 165 BC. So roughly, approximately, the Hanukkah story is halfway through the Second Temple period. The Purim story was earlier. The Purim story was before the Second Temple was built. So, Bime Matisyo ben Yochanan Kohen Gadol, in the days of Matisyo, the son of Yochanan, the high priest, that tells us when this happened. As I said, about halfway through the Second Temple period. Now, this prayer, these words, identify Matisyo as the son of Yochanan Kohen Gadol, Yochanan, the high priest. The question is, why do we have to mention his father, Yochanan Kohen Gadol? Why not just say, Bime Matis Yo, in the days of Matis Yo? Just like the Purim paragraph, Bime Mordechai Esther. It's just their first names. It doesn't give their whole genealogy. It doesn't tell us their father's names. Why is this different since the structure of the two paragraphs for each holiday, the structure is, is similar why should this one give us Matisyo's father's name and not just mention Matisyo? So, first of all, before trying to answer this, I do have to point out to you that there is a lot of debate about whether Yochanan Kohen Gadol is the Yochanan Kohen Gadol we know from the Talmud. In the Talmud, there is a person who is called Yochanan Kohen Gadol. He appears quite prominently in the Talmud. 
So is this Yochanan Kohen Gadol the same one as the one that's mentioned in the Talmud? Or is it another one? Yochanan is not such an unusual name. It could be that there was more than one person named Yochanan who was a Kohen Gadol. So we're not exactly certain, but I would say the consensus of commentators is that we are talking about the same Yochanan Kohen Gadol who is mentioned several times in the Talmud. So, what that means is, we know quite a bit about this father, Yochanan Kohen Gadol, the father of Matis Yehu. Let's assume for tonight that it is the same person. Now, first a historical note. The consequence of the Hanukkah story about halfway through the Second Temple period is that a monarchy is established in Israel. The Hashmonoyim establish a monarchy. It doesn't last for so long, but they establish a monarchy. Before 165, before the Common Era, before the Hanukkah story, the Kohen Gadol was not just the highest spiritual leader of the Jewish people, he was the highest leader of the Jewish people. So this person, Yochanan Kohen Gadol, was a very, very significant leader, a very important person. In fact, the Talmud tells us that this Yochanan Kohen Gadol, Yochanan the high priest, he legislated five different pieces of legislation. Some of them were very bold, that made significant breaks from earlier practice. And this attests to his status and authority that his rulings, which were kind of trailblazing, were accepted and considered normative. He was a very, very important scholar, leader, spiritual leader, and innovator of Jewish law. But with this identification of Yochanan Kohen Gadol as the person who is mentioned a number of times in the Talmud, comes great trouble. Because there's one place in the Talmud, it's in Mesech Brachos that the Talmud tells a horrifying story about Yochanan, the high priest. In addition to the legislation that he legislated, the Talmud tells us this story about his life. And this story is just uh, heartbreaking. The Talmud tells the story that Yochanan Kohen Gadol served as the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. Just remember, highest spiritual leader, highest leader of the Jewish people. The Kohen Gadol, the high priest, is the one who would go inside the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur, the only person who ever went inside, the holiest, the most pious, the most righteous. He served as a Kohen Gadol for 80 years. 8 zero, 80 years. That's a long time to be in that position. Says the Talmud, after 80 years, so he had to have been, what, 90, 100, something like that. After 80 years of serving as the highest spiritual leader of the Jewish people, he became a tzaduki, a heretic. He came to deny the existence of God. How is that possible? The most holy Jew in the whole world, the most pious, the most revered rabbi, scholar, teacher, and after 80 years of serving in this position, he goes off the path. He becomes a heretic, a Russia, an evil person. How is that possible? 
And number two, this strengthens our question from before. In our prayer about Hanukkah, why do we have to mention his name? Matis Yo is his son. Okay, we're not going to hold his son accountable for his father's actions. But why do we have to say Matis Yo, the son of Yochan and Kohen Gadol? Specifically on Hanukkah. Why not just say Matis Yahu and not be reminded of his father who became, after so many years of leadership, became a Russia, a wicked person? It's a very, very, very strange story. So I want to share with you tonight the insight, the answer that is given by Rabbi Chaim Jactor. And he derives this insight from a story that was told by Rabbi Joel Grossman. Now, Rabbi Joel Grossman is a legendary and revered teacher, scholar, educator in New Jersey. And this story that Rabbi Joel Grossman told was about when he was a teenager, decades ago. When he was a teenager, Joel Grossman, I I, I don't want to refer to him like that, you know, because he's such an important person. I don't want to just say Joel, but when this happened, he was just Joel. He was a teenager, Joel Grossman. He lived in Muncie, New York. And from time to time, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein and his wife would come to visit because their daughter and son-in-law lived in Muncie, New York. And whenever Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, the greatest authority in Jewish law in the world during his time, we've talked about him so many, many times, not only the greatest scholar, but one of the greatest characters, one of the great, one of the most refined rabbinic figures in modern era, a giant. So whenever Ramosha Feinstein would come to Muncie to visit, Joel Grossman would take him around. He would drive him. He would go with him. He would take care of him. It was a tremendous honor. And Joel Grossman, as a teenager, notices that Rabbi Moshe Feinstein would utilize every single second learning Torah. At this time, Rav Moshe Feinstein was in his late 80s. And and Joel Grossman sees Rav Moshe Feinstein, if there's even a minute, he's opening up a Mishnah, he's opening up a Talmud, he's opening up a book, and he's studying Torah, even during davening, between one Ali and another, Rav Moshe Feinstein sits and learns for two or three minutes. So Joel Grossman, this, at, at the time, this, this teenager, he says to Ramosha Feinstein, he asks him, Rebbe, at your age, you are the in undisputed greatest scholar of Talmud. You know the entire Torah. You have studied it many, many times. Why do you have to keep utilizing every single second to study more Torah? Haven't you finished by now? So I want you please to listen carefully to the answer that Ramosha Feinstein gave to this teenager, Joel. Because Ramosha's answer is stunning. Ramosha said to this boy, if Yochanan Kohen Gadol could become a heretic, after 80 years of serving as the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, Moshe Feinstein could also become a heretic at the end of his life. Wow. Can you imagine Rav Moshe Feinstein in his late 80s and he decides he's not going to believe in God anymore? I mean, take whatever figure you want to take. Take whatever rabbinic figure you want to take. Take the most beloved figure, rabbinic figure in Montreal. Rabbi Zeitz, he should live and be well. Certainly one of the greatest rabbis I've ever known. Rabbi Shoham, a blessed memory, 
Certainly one of the greatest rabbis I've ever known. Take your pick of what, whoever's your favorite. Can you imagine that Rabbi Zeitz at some point would say, you know what, I had enough. I'm leaving Judaism. I don't believe in God. I mean, it's unthinkable. It's ridiculous. If Yochanan and Kohen Gadol could become a heretic after 80 years of serving as a high priest, Moshe Feinstein could also go off the path after 80 years. What Rab Moshe Feinstein was teaching this boy by this answer is that the shocking conclusion to Yochanan and Kohen Gadol's life tells us that we must be in a mindset of constant spiritual growth. Because the only alternative to spiritual growth is spiritual descent, spiritual abyss. There's no such thing as staying on the same level. Either you're growing or you're falling. Either you're learning more Torah or you are lowering your spiritual level. There's no middle ground. This is, in fact, the message of Hanukkah. Tonight, we lit one Hanukkah light. Tomorrow night before Shabbos, we will light two, and then three, and then four, until the last night we light eight. Why do we do that? Because of this concept that the Talmud says, Malim Bakodesh Ve'em Moridin. We ascend in holiness. We start out with one, and then we go more, and then more, and more. And it's interesting that every night, when we're lighting the menorah, let's say tomorrow night, the first light that we light is the new one because we want to emphasize, I've added, I'm not doing the same as last night. I'm doing more. I'm ascending. So Yochanan Kohen Gadol is essential to how we light the Hanukkah menorah. And therefore, his name must be in the al Hanisim prayer for Hanukkah to remind us of this lesson. Malim Bakodesh ve Maridin. He was elevating himself for his whole life, and then at a certain point he stopped, and he didn't just stay there. He fell. He fell to the worst possible place of wickedness and heresy. Says Rabbi Jachter, we have eight nights of Hanukkah to reinforce this message of constant growth so that we have the spiritual wherewithal to overcome whatever challenges we may face. We start tonight and we must grow from here. We must grow in spirituality just as we grow in the number of candles we light. We must grow in our connection to God We must grow in our unity as one Jewish family because if we do not grow, the only alternative is we fall. So again, Happy Hanukkah. But I ask you, how can we be happy this Hanukkah? With so much darkness and sadness in Israel, for Jews here and around the world, what kind of celebration can we muster for Hanukkah this year? Ofra Lex is a woman who lives in Israel. And she is the mother of Lieutenant Neve Lex, 
who fell in battle on Simchas Torah, October 7th, murdered by Hamas terrorists. And she wrote this week, the holiday of light and miracles, Hanukkah, light, miracles, a family holiday, a holiday of prayer for children, a holiday that sits in the middle of winter and warms the heart. Isn't that what Hanukkah is supposed to be? But she says, is it the truth this year? One of my children, Nebuch, no longer needs to be prayed for. He's no longer alive. How can a person light a candle and drive away the darkness if they feel they have nowhere to light it, if there is no light inside? How in the world can we feel joy and celebrate Hanukkah this year? In 1931, on Hanukkah, Rachel Posner, the wife of Rabbi Akiva Posner, they lived in the town of Kiel, a northern port town in Germany. And it was Hanukkah. They had lit their menorah on the windowsill. And Rachel Posner took a photograph of the menorah. Opposite their apartment was the Nazi Party's regional headquarters with a large swastika flag hanging menacingly from the facade of the building. This photo with both images the menorah on the windowsill in the foreground, and the Nazi flag with a swastika visible across the street. Surely you have seen this photo. It is an iconic photo. And this photo is pregnant with meaning. In 1933, just months after the Nazis came to power, Rabbi Akiva Posner, Rachel, and their three children fled Germany for Palestine, and they took their menorah with them as they built a new life. And they also took the photo that showed the menorah on the windowsill with the Nazi flag behind it. And on the back of the photo, Rachel had written an inscription in German. The flag says, death to Judaism. The light says, Judaism will live forever. Years later, now living in Israel, they loaned their menorah to Jerusalem's Yad Vashem Holocaust Museum with the proviso that the family could take the menorah back each year to light it for themselves on Hanukkah. And more than 90 years later now, the Posner's great-grandson, Akiva Baruch Mansbach, who was named for Rabbi Posner, a few hours ago, he lit this menorah in his home in Beit Shemesh, Israel. And he said in an interview about the menorah and about the famous photo He said, whether it's the Greeks on Hanukkah or the Nazis in Germany, and I would add, or Hamas on Simchas Torah, they want the same thing, 
to destroy the nation of Israel, God forbid. But the menorah symbolizes the strength and continuity of our nation, the idea that it is strong and will conquer all its enemies. The prayer that we add on Hanukkah begins with these words, Al-Hanisim. Al-Hanisim v'al ha-purkon v'al ha-gvuros v'al ha-chuos v'al ha-melchamos she'al sisa l'avaseinu b'yamim ha-hem b'zman hazeh So basically what that means is for all of the miracles and salvations that you, God, have done for us, we thank you. We're grateful to you. We recognize what you've done for us. But it's very curious. We thank God for the miracles and the salvation and the redemption and the battles. We thank God even for the battles we fight. We thank God. How is it even possible to consider? We thank God for the battles we fight today because this is not the Holocaust. We have friends and allies and supporters all over the world, not like in 1939. This was in clear evidence in Washington and in Ottawa. Because we have the state of Israel. Because we are defended by Tzahal, the Israel Defense Force, the most moral, the most spiritual, the most professional, the most committed fighting force in the world. I've shared with you before a couple of stories from my aunt, Joan Crystal, who lives in Efrat in Israel. And here's another story she told. Last Sunday night in Israel, there was a gathering for the survivors of the Nova Party. That was the musical event where 340 beautiful souls were murdered by Hamas terrorists and so many others were taken into captivity as hostages in Gaza. Now this get-together of the survivors drew hundreds of young Israelis who showed up in solidarity with the desire to begin to heal. And this gathering took place in a hall And on the far wall of this hall, there was a sign in huge blue lights in English, we will dance again. Wow. We will dance again. That is the true meaning of what Hanukkah is that no matter how dark, no matter how bleak, no matter how weak we appear, we will dance again. And so I say to you, Dafka this year, Happy Hanukkah! Because we will dance again. My friends, I wish you a beautiful evening, a wonderful Shabbos, and a joyous, in spite of what's happening, or not in spite, because of what's happening, we have to work to bring ourselves to a feeling of joy for Hanukkah, that we will dance again. And I look forward to seeing you all soon in person.